Hello, and thank you all for joining us for tonight's bowl session. Whether you are one of the brave ones here on the webinar with us or watching us live on YouTube, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, this is the bowl session for our recent Monday performance of A King and No King by Beaumont and Fletcher. That performance can still be seen until tomorrow at 7 p.m. So I'm assuming everybody who is watching this has already seen it, but if you have friends or family or professional acquaintances who you think would enjoy it, they still have a little more time to watch it. I am your host, Nathan Winkelstein, the Associate Artistic Director of Red Bull Theater. And um, I'm just going to give us a little bit of information about how tonight's Q&A is gonna work before introducing and inviting our guests on for the day. For those of you who are on the webinar, you can see at the bottom of your screen, you can see both a Q&A option and a hand raise option. Uh, the Q&A is somewhat self-explanatory. You can type any question you want in there. You probably will not see the other questions being asked, so don't think that you are the only one asking and you're shouting into a void. Um, there are others, so please do type in there. And the hand raise function is there for you if you are interested in asking the question yourself, in your voice being heard, uh, asking the question. So basically you would type the question into Q&A and you would click the hand raise button. And if I pick your question and see that a hand is raised next to your name, I will unmute you and you can ask the question yourself. Uh, this does not add or subtract from your chances of having your question asked. It is just if you want to interact more or less uh, with the proceedings. Terrific. So I am now going to introduce uh, my first two guests for the evening, which is the director of the reading you saw on Monday, the wonderful Jose Zayas, and also our guest scholar, Mario de Gangi, who is a professor of English at Lehman College and the Graduate Center CUNY, uh, and wrote the wonderful about the play that you were able to see on our website. Jose and Mario, could you join me? Hello, good evening. Hi. Hello, um, thank you both. Uh, it's, thank you for, for joining me this evening. Um, Mario, can we start with you um, as the resident expert on, on all things Beaumont and Fletcher? <laughs> um, could you tell us just a little bit about this play and these playwrights? Yeah, so Beaumont and Fletcher uh, were well known as uh, collaborators on several plays in this period, early 17th century, uh, including the play Philaster or Love's Li Love Lies a Bleeding, which Red Bull uh, has done a couple times. Uh, but Fletcher is also known uh, for collaborating with Shakespeare towards the end of Shakespeare's writing career. So Shakespeare and Fletcher collaborated on The Two Noble Kinsmen, uh, Henry VIII, and after Shakespeare's retirement, uh, Fletcher took over as the leading dramatist for the Kingsmen. So he was a really, really uh, important figure. Um, Fletcher also was responsible in large part for bringing to the London stage this new genre called tragicomedy. And uh, that's what the, A King and No King, which was written in 1611, is, uh, is a tragic comedy. And in a preface to one of his published works, I'm just going to read you a little bit from Fletcher. He describes what a tragic comedy means. He defines it. And he says, a tragic comedy is not so called in respect of mirth and killing, but in respect it wants deaths or lacks deaths, which is enough to make it no tragedy yet brings some near it, which is enough to make it no comedy. So in other words, it's not like you have comedy on one side and tragedy on the other. It's a kind of mixed or blended kind of hybrid drama where it's not quite a comedy and it's not quite a tragedy. Uh, structurally, tragic comedies were usually comic in that uh, they kind of move towards a happy ending, towards reconciliation and happiness. But along the way, they explore all of these tragic or almost tragic events like deaths and threatened suicides and incests. And so, so they were kind of dark um, uh, comedies in some ways. And just uh, a couple um, little uh, points about the play before I finish. Um, you can see this kind of mixture of comic and tragic moods and languages even in the first scene in A King and No King, uh, if we all remember back to the performance on Monday night. So that first scene um, really moves from, from one kind of mood to another. So it begins with this kind of satiric 
uh, discussion between Bessus and Mardonius about Bessus's cowardice, and Mardonius is, is teasing him about that. Uh, then Arbaces enters, and he becomes this kind of tyrannical, raging king. Um, uh, he almost threatens to become a kind of King Lear, like threatening his counselors. And 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 the, but then, kind of at the last minute, he softens and he agrees that Mardonius is right and that he's going to try to be a better king. So y you're not quite sure where it's moving. And then finally, at the end of that scene, oh, and Arbaces also introduces a kind of romance plot where he wants Tigranes to marry his sister. So you have that in there. And then finally, at the end of that scene, you have um, the letter delivered uh, reporting that uh, Arbasi's mother has tried to kill him again. So all of a sudden, you have this really tragic moment where he's lamenting his sin and why his mother would do this. So it's very typical of tragic comedies that you have this kind of moving between one mood or another, and it's kind of hard to orient yourself. That's in part the, the, pleasure, uh, the pleasure of these plays. Um, I'll just say one last thing about the play. It's a really interesting play structurally in that uh, it's it's a, a play about the, the dethroning of a king, right? It's a play about a king losing his title. And every other play from this period that's about a king losing his title, uh, whether it's, uh, like think of Shakespeare's history plays like Richard II or plays like King Lear, it's a tragedy, right? Kings losing their power is always tragic. But in this play, it's a cause of celebration and happiness. So Beaumont and Fletcher are being very, very witty and kind of wanting people to think, I think, about previous drama. Uh, and and uh, making some really interesting changes on people's expectations. Uh, just just to wrap up, the, the two uh, kind of uh, questions I had in, in seeing the play on Monday that really struck me, um, in part were about the characters of Panthea and Bessus. So I think a really interesting character. So and and maybe Jose, um, uh, this would be uh, uh, you know I, I'll kind of hand it off to you if, uh, if you have some thoughts about this. But something that struck me about Panthea is she begins the play. Uh, kind of just as an object of exchange between two men, right? Like, who's going to marry her? The king says, you're going to marry my sister. She doesn't have any say in that. Um, so for me, it raises the question of how much agency or power Panthea as a woman has in the world of this play and what the play kind of allows her to do and what kind of power it allows her uh, to own. Um, and of course, she becomes the queen at the end of the play. And then Bessus, to me, is is Beaumont and Fletcher thinking back to a character like Falstaff in Shakespeare's Henry IV plays, where one of Falstaff's roles in that play is to kind of puncture or deflate this idealization of male honor, right? All the men in that play want honor. They want fame and honor through the battle, through the battlefield, right? And Falstaff is like, you know, honor can't mend a broken leg. I'd rather be safe and allowed to drink than be honorable. And I think Bess is, is there doing a similar kind of thing, but uh, it's a kind of strange uh, subplot that you have the Arbaces and then the Bess's subplot underneath it. So uh, yeah, those are just some of my thoughts about um, that maybe we could talk about if people are interested. Please sure. jump in. They're much more intelligent questions than I would have asked Jose. So, <laughs> <Come on. laughs> uh, well, no, I mean I'm fascinated by by Bowman and Fletcher, and I have been for for many years. I've actually uh, one of the first plays I produced when I first got to New York was The Maid's Tragedy. I started a company mm -hmm. that's only about ten years. We lasted about five, <laughs> five or six years, and one of the first things we did was Maid's Tragedy here Art Center. So I've always been fascinated by them. I, I read Phil Astor in college. Uh, as well as Maid's Tragedy. And I've never read King and No King, so this was my first time encountering it. Uh, and it was really sort of delightful uh, going back to sort of the madness and the weirdness and the wackiness of, the, of their worlds and uh, the beauty of their, of their verse as well. It's really surprising. It always sneaks up on me. Uh, and uh, my thesis in, in, in grad school was Tis Pity She's a Whore. So I have done the incest plays or the incest narratives where you're basically asked to look at uh, a pair of lovers and uh, sort of treat their dilemma with empathy. Uh, it's uncomfortable, it's strange. And uh, uh, I think that the centerpiece of this is that beautiful sequence that uh, I think Chuck and, uh, and Kara did so beautifully, even the first time they read it. Because the most important thing is just to be really open with that scene and just listen. And, mm -hmm. you know, just, it is about that agency, but it's also about, it's a love story in its own weird way. And you really want to embrace that as much as possible amidst all of the weird whiplash inducing moments as well. Uh, but in regards to uh, Panthea, or Panthea, it, again, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out pronunciations <laughs> of the play, but with uh, Panthea, we, uh, uh, I think she does have a lot of great agency. Uh, she's, she's very clear about what she wants from the very beginning. Uh, Kara, of course, helped us really, she never went into an easy victim mode. I think she was really lovely, clear spoken. She was very direct. Uh, and what I wanted, I wanted it to get a little bit looser. And I think that was some of the stuff that we really talked about uh, during the process. 
But I think all the women in this play have great agency. I mean, Spiconia is always very direct about what she wants in the end, she goes for it. Same thing with Irani. I mean, like <laughs> she, she's making really extreme choices, but she's making them and like, and obviously she doesn't get killed for this. So it does have a tragic, that, that happy ending regardless. Uh, but I think Athea's uh, journey is really exciting. Uh, and there's, um, you know, with more rehearsal, what I would want to try to achieve is, is uh, there's a decadence to how they view the court world. I think that's part of their satire. And uh, I think that how does she embrace this mm -hmm. love? How does she kind of like, there's a giddiness that I think occurs as the scene progresses, as they actually find that they are attracted to each other. And really sort of like getting to the core of that would be very interesting. Uh, and I think that, you know, we did a beautiful job with that, uh, but there's so much more to like mine there and so much like the physicality of that scene should be really rich and dangerous. And it's just this beautiful dance where you're like, are they going to or are they not? Uh, sort of like upping the stakes for, for the sort of wonderful amorality of it. Uh, but I, I, I just really love how they're able to, to pull that off. And then like, unlike Ford, they go to a place where like, it's fine. They solve it, they resolve it. And these people can go through the journey of thinking that they're doing something that's immoral, but ultimately come down and they can come to a place of, uh, of love and forgiveness and hopefully like connection. But there are lots of questions that come up, like who's gonna be king? What's left? I mean, <laughs> is this entire place gonna fall apart as soon as like he, he lets it go? So uh, I don't yeah. think they're thinking beyond that. No, it's um, interesting that in, instead of creating Panthea as this kind of purely chaste, like perfect kind of untouchable, well, like you're right, like she does kind of acknowledge her sexuality and she's the one that says, you know, camp brothers and sisters kiss, like we can do that, right? And, uh, and but you, you still empathize with her. So it's, it's a really interesting, like um, multi-layered uh, characterization of this woman, right? Yeah, and the only person who seems to be genuinely upset by the incest is, is their bosses. Everybody else, I mean, Bessis and Panthea, who are the people who really embrace that, are like, okay, yes, we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me just take this time once again just to remind the audience that uh, the Q&A is open, so please do engage uh, whenever anything happens that I, 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 I see your names and I know there are some, scho some scholars in this crew who probably have opinions and questions, um, so please do feel free <laughs> to engage. And then... Jose, just um, going off of uh, the second prompt that Mario had given you about Bessis, I, I was also going to ask, Mario talked a lot about um, the to tonal shifts in uh, tragic comedy. And I, I feel like whenever uh, a director hears tonal shifts, they're like, oh boy, uh, what's the, like, how do I approach the, how do I kind of put the play in its, how do I find the tone of the play that allows the whole darn thing to work honestly? And I feel like that's one of the, director's kind of most important aspects. W how did you approach that? Well, I mean, you know, with the time we have, it's so challenging because it's like already really difficult material. So the way I did, I just really wanted them to read it first. I wanted to hear all those voices together. So I'm, not, I'm talking nitty gritty stuff here. Uh, so from the very, you know, on our first rehearsal, what I did was I just wanted to hear everybody. I did not really want to interrupt much because I wanted to hear how, how they understood the text. I also sort of gave them access to an annotated version of it. So some of the more obscure references that they could research themselves and really get to the meaning of it. And once we did that in the second and third readings, what I started trying to hear was how they were understanding the tone of the piece. So the few directions that I really did get, give uh, aside from like, you know, because we have to do all the Zoom stuff, I don't want to spend too much time with that, but we're about tone and we're finding a handful of places where I basically encourage them to find, uh, to either embrace a particular moment of lightness or a particular moment of darkness. Because uh, basically when you're reading that quickly, sometimes this stuff goes way beyond you. But if you make a choice at the beginning of the scene where you're like, oh, this scene wants to be light. Like when we first read the Marjonius and Bessa scene at the top, it, was, it, it felt very heavy. And we were coming out of war and they were talking about war. And so that we were really in a place where I think is like these soldiers were really worrying about the situations. And so uh, what I asked the prompt I give like Bob and, uh, and CJ was like, you know, think of it as like, these are soldiers celebrating a victory and they should be ribbing each other, should be having fun. Mardonius ultimately does like uh, Bessus, even though he's constantly chastising him. So as soon as you get to the truth of that character relationship, then the tone kind of takes care of itself. And then with Chuck, I mean, he, everybody is so good at the verse, but with Chuck is just sort of emphasizing like the truth of it, never winking at the audience and trusting the turns, 
you know, the good thing about a reading is that you don't think. You're just sort of like acting on the line sometimes. And Chuck would just sort of like, at a moment, he like, and this is happening and I'm going for it. And so that sort of keeps everyone around him on their toes and it keeps the audience on his toes. So I think that's sort of one of the ways I, I really want to approach it. And of course, getting to the ending where you go from the high stakes of people are gonna die to awe and wonder and sort of delightful merriment because it's all solved. So um, we do have one question from the audience that I think is a, a particularly good one for you, Jose. And then after that, we will bring on the actors who have also had to deal with all of these tonal shifts as you're describing. It'll be interesting to hear their, their take on it. But um, if you could quickly, this is from, uh, I, let's go with Vimala. Um, I apologize if that's incorrect. And uh, they ask, can you talk a bit about what it was like to pare down the text and produce a performance script? How difficult or simple a matter was that? What didn't make it in? What are audiences missing, if anything, if they haven't read the play as it appeared in print in the 17th century? <laughs> oh, on my end, it's, it's, it's great. I was gonna do a lot of the pairing, but it's like you guys had done a reading of it uh, and Michael Sexton did the adaptation of it originally. And uh, I think he nailed a lot of the stuff that I, I, I mean, he got rid of a two or three major scenes. I think there were a couple of crowd scenes when our bosses comes back from war and basically we're hearing the populi and everybody talking about, and Mario can talk a little bit more about this and what that stirs plot wise. Uh, Cause I also wanted Mario to talk a little bit about who they were satirizing. Cause it was, who, who was, was it James who was the king at that point? And what that meant for them to basically print this title <laughs> and basically call for him to, to be no king. Uh, but no, I mean, I think the adaptation was really, really clear in what Michael did. Uh, I think in hearing it, I maybe would have edited a little bit more. Uh, I some, some clarified a couple of the jokes, but some of the jokes were so physical uh, that that's why I opted instead of trying to physicalize everything through Zoom, I just wanted it to be language. The language is so clear. Like you always know what's happening. And if you don't know, you'll catch up in a second. Like, you know, that's sort of the beauty, beauty of, of them as dramaturgs. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think we just basically got rid of some of the, the, the noises, the noisier aspects of the play and really focus, I think, on the central relationships. Yeah, I remember there's a big scene with citizens when Arbaces comes back and it's a lot of, I think he says, I'm bringing you peace. And they say, peas, who needs peace? I mean, it's like kind of silly, goofy scene. But but in terms of the politics of the play, you know, I, I think it is a really interesting play in that regard. But um, one monarch is being replaced by another, but the play is still insisting on the importance of a monarchical system, right? It's not It's not saying we shouldn't have a king. Um, we just don't have the right king because of the way these bloodlines have been manipulated. So so I think always with, with these uh, playwrights, with Shakespeare as well, uh, they they get away with a lot. You know, there's a lot of leeway given to, to making uh, plays that, that touch on political matters um, without, you know, necessarily uh, uh, falling afoul of, um, of the censors or, or really getting in trouble, which happened once in a while. But, uh, and I think in this play too, you know, there's an important distinction that King's James, King, King James would, would himself uh, kind of make between being a king um, and a tyrant, so like a good king and a, and a, and a tyrant. So I, I, in the title, A King and No King, I also hear this debate about what's the difference between a king and a tyrant? What's the difference between a good king or a legitimate king and a tyrant? And being no king, in a sense, being no king is is kind of leaving that, that space of virtuous um, sovereignty and becoming a tyrant. And I, the play actually explores those issues too with Arbaces, right? You know, he says, um, uh, nobody, uh, if anybody claims this woman is my sister, they'll be executed. You know, it's absurd, right? You can't like, <laughs> right, uh, have as a king, you can't command that people just think the way you think and, and say something that's real isn't real, it doesn't work. Uh, so I do think the play is exploring those issues too, but in a way that's again, comic um, and uh, doesn't seem in any way like a direct attack on the king. Right. I mean, do you think the outrage and outrageousness of the plot is a way to do that and get away with it? They're like, oh, our king would never be in, in an incestuous relationship, but it's a way to get these things across regardless. And it's distanced with these weird characters and places. And, you know, uh, so so it's 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 in a, another uh, part of the world. And um, you, there's a lot of um, kind of plausible deniability built in the, into these plays. <laughs> this has nothing to do with England. It's in, you know, Armenia or whatever. Right? Right. So, yeah. Well, and it, it, expl it, it reminds me of... Um, of something that's stated between two of the actors we have, who I'm going to bring on in just a moment, but that Mardonius, when he first finds out about this desire 
has that very explicit speech about how if you do this, you cannot punish anyone else for doing anything, which strikes me as a very kind of pointed um, talk about corruption in general. Um, and is one of these moments of the difference between tyrant and king and, and where that falls is if you if the laws do not apply to you and you force them upon others, that's tyrannical, um, which is which is is fascinating. And on that note, let's bring him in. Um, Chuck, uh, Chuck Woody Awuji, who played Arbaces, uh, Robert Cuccioli, who played Mardonius. And Edmund Donovan, who played Tigranes, thank you, all three of you, for joining us for this. Um, uh, it's such a pleasure to have you all. I know you've given us a lot of time over the last week, and thank you for continuing to to give uh, in this giving season. Um, I, before we give any specific questions, I just wanted, you've now listened for 15 minutes to people kind of spieling about so a lot of So that's what the play was about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you understand it now? <laughs> um, well, I was wondering if that if that um, evoked any any response or thought out of any of the three of you, or if you were all busy having a cocktail while that first fifteen minutes was going. And just want to jump to the questions. <laughs> I'm always drawn by what what what. I mean, I guess being of the same period, you always ask those plays those political plays, you're always wondering, like, you think of the end of Richard III, is Richmond really going to be a good king? What's he going to be like? It's those those hanging endings where we're, like, being told, and that was classic Shakespeare. He couldn't come out and say, actually, the Tudors have no right to be in power. He couldn't come out and say that. So what does he say? He gives a guy who's supposed to be uniting us a, a slightly scary, you know, finishing speech, you know, and if you if you mine into it. So... And then you're right, I never thought about this, Mario, but that thing, so he's no longer king. So now she's the queen. She's had no experience of being the queen. And how are people going to take that? You know, I, I, you, he always just, it's a lovely thing to live a, leave a world, not so much the play, but a world a bit messy afterwards, you know, especially given the time these guys were writing, because there's all the whispers of legitimacy and illegitimacy and all that stuff going on, but you're not really allowed to talk about it, are you, you know, openly? Yeah. Um, can I ask, uh, Bob, uh, for you, we were talking a lot about the tone um, aspect beforehand, and of course you end up in this fascinating situation at the top of the play where you're sort of both comedic straight man right away opposite Bessus, and then you have to turn around and be almost like tragedic straight man opposite Arbaces five minutes later. Um, how did you find uh, kind of walking that balancing act in this particular play? Like uh, an Elizabethan Dean Martin. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I think that um, uh, actually it was it was a really great note that Jose gave me because I was feeling that it was uh, I was feeling that he that Mardoni is needed to be the uh, the the leveler all the time, you know, and and to feel that kind of uh, mantle made me feel like it needed to be more serious but it really it was better to go the opposite direction and to for be to someone who was more uh took everything more with the it, it everything kind of went off the the shoulders more and down the back and and i treated i saw people for who they were even the king and and was able to get away with with my uh my uh, uh uh, 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 feelings of what should be done uh, with a more casual attitude about it. And that was something that I think, uh, Jose, you were saying before, or Mario, I can't remember, is that uh, it, the whole court in this, in this play had more of a casual feel to it than, than many courts that we run into in in these kind of plays, there's something more structured about it. There's something more uh, formal uh, about it. And this was, this had more of a casual feel. Um, yeah, for sure. I, I wanted to ask about that because that was something that Jose, you had felt the kind of decadence of it. Um, but also I had, I had felt this sort of casual aspect as well. I guess there's, those are probably not as exclusive as they feel 
this it, well it feels very modern that way it feels like a lot of this stuff you know i was just watching succession a couple days before that so it feels like we're basically in these boardrooms and people are having really high stakes conversations and they're equally witty and fun but but it's very intimate and of course when you're doing this on zoom it creates a different intimacy the the way you handle verse is different the way you talk to each other when you listen is, is different so I think that definitely uh, calls for that. Uh, I mean, it's not like some of their other plays where you like have to justify a whole mask, like a maze strategy. You're like, how do you get to that? So you have to rationalize it. But this play doesn't have that. This play actually has a, a really sort of delightful quietness and intimacy and interiority at points that I, I think uh, is really great for to, to do on Zoom. I think, I think too, what people are responding to, and, and also in part to, to um, build on on Chuck's point about you know the, the power that kings have in, in these plays uh, is that you have to remember too, and we see in this play that kings, despite their centrality and their importance and claiming divine right and all of that, they never run the government alone. There's always tons and tons of counselors and advisors and you have Gobrius in this play who really is you know, kind of running the government while Arbaces is off for, you know, X years in Armenia fighting a war, right? And Gobrius is there running the government, right? Uh, and Mardonius is a kind of counselor figure as well, like Kented King Lear, like the person who's going to say, you know what, King, you may be the king, but you're wrong, and you're going to pay for this if you keep acting this way, right? And it's up to the king whether or not they will, you know, accept that. Of course, King Lear doesn't, um, but Arbaces does. After a while, he says, okay, you know, you're right. I am being kind of, you know, a jerk and I'm going to try to reform myself. So it, you always have to remember, like, the way that power is distributed in these plays, which makes them much more interesting. And to the point of what we edited, there is a big edit regarding the relationship, though. And uh, we cut a lot of stuff regarding, like, understanding their history. So that stuff, I think, like, we just assume some things about the relationship, but they do get deeper into, like, the, I mean, like, like, the, the teacher uh, and student relationship with um, Let me ask, just quickly changing tracks, just to get our our uh, our third uh, performer involved. Hi, Edmund. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question for you because it's you. Your character also sort of serves a very important uh, role right off the bat as appearing to be the sort of opposite side of the coin of royalty to our bases, mm -hmm. um, and yet. As we go along in the play, in your own journey, you actually end up being sort of prone to extreme swings of emotion and attraction in your own right. How did you find, I guess both, how did you find playing um, Tigranes both in terms of, I'm trying to think of how to put this, his role, the role that he served inside the play as both this, the yang to Arbase's yin, but also somewhat parallel? Yeah, yeah. It's funny, I, um, when Mario and um, Jose were speaking earlier about the tragic comedy and the tonal aspects of the, of the play, I was reminded that I've, I've never experienced Beaumont and Fletcher uh, before in a reading or rehearsal setting, but I, in drama school I did Tis Pity She's a Whore and I played Giovanni, which is, has, as Jose was pointing out, a lot of similarities uh, in terms of just the events of the play and the um, themes, you know, deception and lying and uh, incest. Um, but they're handled so much differently, and there, there's like so much more in this play. There's so much more forgiveness, and there's such a quicker flip flop that's happening on a personal level with each character, and then, um, yeah, like throughout the course of the play. So I think, um, I don't know if this is answering your question, but I think that he just he just flips a lot quicker than the f characters I was familiar with that went through similar things in a Jacobean play, like Tis Pity, where. You know, everything just sort of spirals down and just gets worse throughout the entire play. Whereas here, you know, he sort of, um, he forgives himself, he forgives our bosses, uh, Spaconia forgives him, etc. You know, so there's a lot of like kind of going to hell and coming back. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we have Lynn is, our friend Lynn in Q&A is single-handedly holding down our audience participation aspect. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and has a has a series of questions, but one of them I think uh, ties into that, and it's actually for Chuck. Uh, she has two questions that deal with the same issue, which is the rec reconciling the fact that our bosses at the end of this play, supposedly, gives up the kingdom and the power that he has borderline abused throughout the play for a woman that he's in love with, and as a character who swung so very much and uh, 
that you were able to manage to handle so honestly. How do you how did you justify that final full commitment to leaving royalty for love? You know, it's weird. I I did not struggle with it at all. It's his the entire there's a uh, I think it's very clever. I think there's something about him that the very note that we talked about with Jose about how I shouldn't be frightened of spinning on a sixpence, you know, on a dime, you know. I think there's a side of him that just, the, the, it, 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 nothing, he, the things he cares about are so fickle, it seems, in the thing. It's like, I'm going to brag about battle, but it's to the point where he's so good at it that it has become slightly fickle. He's used to winning. And then Panthea appears and he's not used to that. And so for me, the logic of it was that the kingdom, the crown, set up, 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 set up um, opposite Panthea and that feeling of this is something I can't conquer. This, the most, some of the most beautiful language in it is him speaking to God about how have you left me here after all I've done? Is that submission? Is that recognition for the first time of defeat? That if the gift is Panthea at the end, it wasn't, I'd never, I never struggled to give up the crown. It was something I wanted to do. I was more invested in trying to describe the chariots of diamonds and wheels of gold. I was more invested in that, in getting that right for them than giving up the crown. It felt surprisingly easy is the answer. And I think it's because he's had him the entire play psychologically as a performer, hence as a person he's portraying, jumping around because things are so doable for him, they don't matter. Including upsetting this closest to him and then winning them back. That when she stands up as just the opposition to all that. So if the gift is to win her at the end, the crown, Almost doesn't matter. Does that make sense? <laughs> I hope that makes sense. That's how I felt. Everything could come and go with this guy. And that was the only way to play him, I feel, you know. That's interesting. I, 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 it, it's interesting that you, you say that. And Nathan, this is an interesting question because I, I heard it differently. I yeah. heard it as, um, I mean, it happened so quickly that it's almost like he knew that he was really not giving up the crown by marrying her. Right. So uh, he was he was giving his generosity was was to give her the crown as queen, but he was still going to remain king. Yeah, by, it's so by marrying good. her. Yeah, I love I love that tapestry. I mean, great writing ultimately is it an empty canvas that you then fit a tapestry to. But for me, it was the crown. Just I completely did not care about the crown, you know. It's so weird that you, I'm glad you heard it that way because it lays it in a different way because for me it was absolutely, the father being able to call someone father, that great sequence of I'll just lie down here and, and yeah. I won't move till my hairs get gray or something, silver hairs and stuff. Those are the things, love and being, being truly, um, belonging to something that isn't the posturing but i think that's it's very fletcher you know this very this stuff this stuff that seems to matter doesn't mm -hmm. really matter that the crown suddenly for me was the opposite became very trivial at the end for something that matters it's just so amazing to me the language he has for his father for gabrias it's just i was like where the hell does that come from yeah. you know uh and then the the language he has when he says to God, don't please just rip, rip this, rip this out of me, you know, compared to everything else, including the crown. And I, I always think like with Edmund, like when we were the beginning about the bragging back and forth and you're like, Jesus, you can brag and he can brag. And I just feel that things of real value, they're like a Grecian urn. You don't brag about them. You almost want to be like a dragon protecting its gold about it. You don't want to... <laughs> You don't want to brag about the things you really care about. And I think there's something about it to Grannis who's like, Dane, that's not how you talk about power and conquering and being a king. That's not how you do it, right? I don't know if I'm putting, but that's the impression I got from it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny because to Grannis's 
you used the word fickle and it reminded me that he uses that about himself in the negative. You know, he says, I'm not fickle. And that's exactly yeah. what he says, you know? He's like as fickle as anyone else in the play. Yeah. Yeah, and it is interesting at the end, thinking about it now, this has been fascinating for me just to hear it, because at the end we end up having these odd parallels where um, Jacques Arbaces is so insistent that, like, Tigranes is going to marry a, a royal, and that, and that Panthea is going to marry a royal. And yet at the end of the play, Tigranes is the king marrying and bringing up a lady to his station, whereas weirdly Arbaces becomes the the person who's being brought up to the station of the queen and that that that's the power dynamic i question kind of post show is the the very slight change of the king mar being in love with someone and marrying them versus the queen being the one who pulls up our bosses mm. um and whether or not that would but then again he seems very quick to be like sure Panthea, lead the way so maybe he's very happy with that with that situation i'm not sure and also it might change in five minutes if the play carried on <laughs> right that's how bass is it could in five minutes it could go well hold on a minute <laughs> But I just give up. It, I mean, that's the sort of guy that's being created, and I think that comes into the inversive, it's sort of the sort of complete um, subversion of Beaumont and Fletcher in their writing. It's like that consistency, playing with it, because there's some really dangerous stuff about portraying a king in that way. Also, you know, people were very careful about unless you were writing about the French. And I know they're in Armenia or whatever, but unless you were specifically saying the French court, there's very, di it was, it wasn't, it was a bit, people be aware of, that's a king you're writing like that. That's a court you're writing like that, you know? So. I have a, a zinger here from our friend Tanya Pollard, our uh, Scott oh, friend Tanya, Tanya Pollard here. Um, Hello, this Tanya. is for you. This is for you, Chuck. Um, I'm curious to hear uh, from Chuck about any echoes uh, and dissonances he might have felt in relation to Shakespearean figures he's played. Othello's bout of possessive fury, Hamlet's nihilism. I'm curious about how Beaumont and Fletcher's relationship with Shakespeare might spill over into uh, the experience of inhabiting the characters. Yeah, I almost felt there was a sense, um, oh, there's a line he says to Panthea something about that reminded me so much of Othello's line, and when I love thee not, chaos is come again. There's a line he says to her, he doesn't use the word chaos, he uses, oh God, I forget, but was like, I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's like, that's borderline, that's really appropriation right there. I sort of felt in playing this, I could see how, I don't actually know what the actual relationships were, because we all know as artists that, you know, Go Vidal, you know what I mean? The, the, <laughs> yeah, when you think of Go Vidal saying, talking about seeing a fellow artist fail is something he loved. Um, so <laughs> I, I just wonder, um, there's, uh, there's subversion. I'm going to come back to this word. It's so subversive the way they write to the point that I feel they're almost subversive of the success of Shakespeare. I feel like they're, they're, they're turning in, they're turning the, they're turning it in upon themselves to subvert what people expect to come see in a play. Uh, to subvert political discourse, to subvert how you fall in love. The very fact that she, they're sisters and brothers and then we don't go deep into a tragedy that pulls them apart. We then make it all rosy and happy in the end. So what play are we doing? Are we doing Trollis and Cressida or are we doing Twelfth Night? You know, I just feel like it's very... Um, I, I think they're nodding their hats to the greatness of the man, but I think at the same time, they're just, they're, they're ready to, to completely subvert it. And I, I saw echoes in the language that felt like they were pulled out of Shakespeare, literally, but they're not allowed in the same way Marlowe and Shakespeare will sh would, would respectfully adorn or strip away each other's work. This sort of felt like they threw it in there, used it and said, let's not dwell on it. Let's move over, you know? Um, psychologically also was the same thing. I, I felt that, I remember playing Othello and thinking, oh God, I can't share any of my monologues to the audience because Shakespeare had created a very strong mental barrier between him being able to release, a really, he, did, she didn't, he didn't want him to have a release valve. And I felt with Abbasis that there was something going on about that, so much in his head, that speech at the beginning where you, he follows you into the room, um, Bob, and you say, look at him killing himself. There's something almost Ophelia-like of that. I saw so many echoes of it, but it's mm -hmm. almost like they refuse to go fully there. It's like, we know what you're thinking, but we're not gonna do that with you, you know? That's how I felt with it. 
Um, Mario, do you can you speak whether is it is it pure um, is it a pure hypothetical that these playwrights were sort of one upping? Because what Chuck was saying made me think about like the stuff that like Shakespeare and Marlowe with blank verse and then Shakespeare with Romeo and Juliet going, watch me write a play half as a comedy and then turn it around. And like, was this kind of format breaking? Do you think there was a one-upsmanship to the crafting of the play structures as a whole? Is that like where tragic comedy came from to some extent? I, mean, I, I think part of it is always to remember too that theater was a business, right? And they needed to get people to come in. This was their livelihood, and one way to get people to come in is to is to make new kinds of plays and offer new kinds of merchandise, right? So I think they were always kind of innovating anyway, just because you know you play the same kind of play over and over again, no one wants to come anymore. But I think absolutely, yeah. They, they. I, I mean, even Philaster is a kind of rewriting of Twelfth Night. Um, and a complicating of Twelfth Night, because in Philaster, uh, the the you know the young woman who is the kind of woman in disguise, you're not quite sure exactly how things are going to end up with her at the end. So I, I do think that one of the ways they innovated was to borrow uh, plots and motifs from each other and and push them uh, push them in, in in new directions. Um, you know, it's funny because uh, in like the earlier twentieth century. Critics um, writing about Beaumont, Beaumont and Fletcher were very dismissive of them, and they often used language like degeneration. You know, like Shakespeare had written these great psychologically complex, you know, plays, and Beaumont and Fletcher things just start to get kind of like decadent. Decadent was a word they used all the time that they were decadent, that they became too um, trivial and superficial, and things happen too quickly, as kind of Chuck was saying that that things aren't explored, they're just kind of, um, but it, it's it's really, to think of Beaumont and Fletcher's dramaturgy, um, more just as experimental and pushing things in new directions and, you know, like with the incest turning out okay and kind of just seeing um, what they could get away with and how they could build on those older structures, something, something new. I think it's really great theater. Um, it's really exciting in a different way than Shakespeare's. Another thing you can you could do is compare uh, a play like A King and No King to the kinds of tragic comedies or romances that Shakespeare was writing at the same time, like The Winter's Tale or The Tempest, um, which also have forgiveness and reconciliation. But again, um, there's something very different about the kind of tragic comedy Beaumont and Fletcher writing. It is more satirical. It's more hard hard edged. It's got a lot more, you know, kind of body humor and things like that. I think than Shakespeare's tragedy uh, tragic comedies. But uh, they're all writing at the same time and watch and going to see each other's plays and even co-writing some of these. Can I ask a tangential question while acknowledging something embarrassing about myself? Um, which is that I read Philaster for the first time uh, last year before we did the reading and I was reading it. And I think I had the experience that maybe the audiences at the time would have it where at the end of the show, when it turned out she was a girl, I was like, oh, dang, she was a girl. And then I felt really dumb about it. Because I was like, of course she's a girl. I know how these plays work. Um, but I was still just <laughs> shocked in the moment. And it occurred to me, like, are there any, because Shakespeare I don't think ever does it. Are there any other plays that don't tell you that it's a girl in disguise as a boy? Is that the only, because I would imagine that at the time, the audience couldn't possibly know because it was a boy. The Right? Like the mm -hmm. actor was a boy. They wouldn't have known that that was... So I'm just wondering if that was new to them. I think that's the first one that does that, um, that you know makes that innovation. And uh, just a, a, a kind of um, parallel from Shakespeare that he, he generally doesn't do that either. He, you know, he tells you that you know from the beginning that a character says, hey, I'm gonna dress like a boy. But there is that moment in The Winter's Tale where uh, at the end of act three, Hermione is dead. Um, and he never tells you in the play, oh, she's not really dead. She was faking it. And, you know, she comes back and acts five as, as a statue. Uh, and it's, it's kind of hard to know how to read that. But that's a kind of parallel moment where he's keeping some crucial information from the audience. And it becomes this kind of wonderful surprise or shock. Um, and I think, again, Beaumont and Fletcher are being really clever and, and thinking, how can we take this tried and true formula of the girl dressing as a boy and make it genuinely something surprising for the audience? Um, and then, of course, you know, other playwrights would try different kinds of tricks and variations and motifs. But yeah, so I, I think it, it, I think you read the play correctly or that maybe that's the response that they wanted. Absolutely. It was great. It was yeah. great. It was, it was a very fun moment for me. It's not the kind of moment I was used to getting reading classical yeah. theater. 
Yeah. Um, so it was fun. Um, let me, uh, I've got a question here from, from our, our stalwart Lynn again um, for Bob. Uh, your part was well written, but more importantly, you made it absolutely necessary as the quote, sane, observing, mediating character. Uh, I like what you said about your character. Was it an easy character to play virtually and in the, I'll add, and in this script and why or why not? Yeah, I think it was, it was, uh, it was not difficult to play in this venue. Um, I, I, as uh, Jose was saying before, I, it's really all in the words. And uh, I think that with uh, Mardonius, it was, it was mostly, it, it's in the words. Uh, he's not really a, a terribly physical character. It didn't seem like in the, in the reading of it. So that didn't, um, I didn't feel constrained by the, by the venue at all. Um, but yeah, but that was something actually that I that I was uh, remarking before, as to how to deal with this play or any of these plays uh, when there's so much physicality involved, and uh, and I thought I thought you accomplished it beautifully, Jose. I thought that uh, you know whatever what what was done, especially with Bessus and uh, with. Um, Oh, uh, what's the character's name? Lagonis. Socorro. Socorro. What? Lagonis. Lagonis. Yes. I mean, it just it just worked out so beautifully. It worked out perfectly. And uh, with Bacurius also, and then Bacurius beating up the yes, the, yes, kicking the swordsman, the, kicking the yeah. swordsman. I I think it just it worked out perfectly. Yeah. I think I, in many ways this might be actually I might lose a lot of sympathy saying this but in many ways i think they sort of sometimes handle slapstick much better than shakespeare actually you know i i got am i have i i can hear the collective <gasps> going on in the whatever but I, I i like i was laughing hard at those scenes the whole like the ridiculous again i think it helps their ridiculous nature they're ready to push it they're almost like monty python before monty python they're ready to just push it to what edge and keep gauging and knowing how far they can push every aspect of it before they pull it back, you know? I found that really fascinating. Yeah. Um, there's a question here about, from uh, Vimala again, about, oh, Vimala also says, by the way, that apparently Fletcher's the loyal subject also has a cross-dressed character that isn't revealed earlier to the audience. Uh, so thank you for that. Now I have another play to read. Um, so. <laughs> That's fine. I, I get some time off over the break. Um, but he he also has a question about the uh, about Panthea's generosity to Spaconia. Can you d all discuss the two female characters, not just their degrees of agency, but uh, their conduct and investment in relationships with others? And I think I'd like to toss this first to Edmund because it was something I was going to bring up earlier. Was like it really was remarkable to me watching this play, and it was a remarkable, I think, from the writing perspective and from the acting of the four of you that despite or maybe because of all of the machinations that happened between the four of you, we really did, or at least I found myself believing at the end that these two couples would be happy, that they had kind of come through the crucible and together. And Edmund, how was it uh, for you? Uh, unfortunately, Teresa and Kara couldn't join us tonight, but um, how was it for you sort of both act acting opposite Teresa in that role and watching those interactions? Yeah, it was, um, I agree with you completely. Was, I totally bought it by the end. But I also agree with Chuck that it's very possible that things could have changed again had the play gone for another five minutes. So. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, Teresa was, was incredible. There's that, uh, but again, like the, the toggle is so, it, it turns on a dime. Again, to use something that Chuck said, there's that, that moment after when, when uh, Swaconia and Tigranis have their scene together where he's sort of repenting and saying he doesn't want to be her and how you know how dare he self-flagellating and then she comes in and and kind of you know reads him the riot act and then forgives him kind of all in one speech before he can even say anything you know it, it's like it all sort of it just sort of all happens and as jose was saying earlier it just requires the actor to kind of take that roller coaster ride and i think she did that so well the characters those two women are are so the characters, the actors as well, but they're so virtuosic and so good, you know. Um, 
they really want to help each other. It's a beautiful way to me, um, Panthea just is a good ruler. I mean, just simple as that. It's like, you know, as soon as we see your generosity towards Spaconia, the way she deals with the court, the way she's able to handle everyone around her. I think it's also sort of them showing us she's going to be a good queen. And she's basically men. I mean, obviously it gets her on, uh, it gets us on her side completely. But I, I love that section as well. I'm glad that was brought up um, between us two women. I think it's fascinating. And I think they're so really lovely and delightful to each other. And uh, I think Spaconia learns a lot from Panthea as well. I think it's like her generosity comes through because of that as well, because of what she's seeing. I mean, I think there's examples that uh, are being followed. Do you think Mario, um, it was interesting, I hadn't really thought about this in terms of its historical perspective, um, but uh, obviously they have very recent evidence in in England of a very powerful and well-liked, at most parts of her reign, queen. Um, do you think that there was, that some of this, like having such an empowered person who is empathic to her followers, who becomes the queen um, and all of that stuff. Do you think that was Beaumont and Fletcher nodding to Elizabeth? Uh, or do you think that was? I, I mean, one thing I was thinking when we were just talking about the women was that there's this, um, you know, conventionally um, women in this period were, were deemed to be more passionate and men were deemed to be more reasonable, right? That was this ancient, you know, stereotype about the genders. But it's really interesting in a play like this where um, the men are passionate, you know, like Arbaces is, is passionate. He keeps going back and forth and the women are so reasonable and generous as, as, as Jose was saying. Um, whether it has anything to do with Queen Elizabeth is hard to say. But uh, people have pointed out that um, when you get into the Jacobean period, you start having dramas written with female characters in the center, like the Duchess of Malfi, right? So, you know, the, you, it's not Hamlet and King Lear and Macbeth anymore. It's, it's the Duchess of Malfi is the center character of that play. Um, so, uh, again, it, it could have been that, uh, you know, people are obviously thinking about Queen Elizabeth and her model as a queen. I think she shows up in, in other plays as well in, in different forms. Again, maybe in The Winter's Tale in some form. Um, but, uh, but, but again, just an, another evolution of, of dramatic form as well, that uh, what happens if we put a woman at the center of a play, uh, at the center of a tragedy? Uh, how does that change things? Um, yeah. Great. Um, well, we are we are coming near to the end of our time and near to the end of our questions. Uh, so unless anybody else has some active thoughts that they really want to get in off of anything that was said, I think we will call it there. Um, and thank you all for attending. Uh, it's It's been such a uh, pleasure to have you all and to have all of your questions. We are uh, we are taking a break through Christmas and New Year's and we will be back on January 11th with a reading of The African Company Presents Richard III by Carlisle Brown. So please do check out that. And that will also have a full session the following Thursday. Um, and if you enjoyed tonight's programming, please do uh, please do consider making a tax deductible donation to Red Bull Theater because everything we do is free this season and it's Christmas and blah, 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 blah. Um, and <laughs> on that note, thank you all. Uh, have a wonderful night. Have a wonderful holiday season and see you in, thank goodness, 2021. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Real pleasure. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Take care.